busiest years I've ever been alive, I think. They, uh, it was like every week or a couple days, some new crazy thing was happening. And, and, and me and anybody else I know who really loved God were like, oh, we got to pray again. Well, what the heck's over there? Okay, we got to see God. Well, in, at the end of 2021, Barnard um, Research Group released the results of a survey asking American Christians about their prayer life. And it turned out, the results of their survey were that 69, only 69% of Christians during those years um, had prayed dur at any one time in the last week. 21%, th sorry, 31% of Christians during the most whacked years that I've ever been alive thought they could get by a week without crying out to God. Like they see all the problems, all the things going on, authoritarian governments and misinformation, lies from the media, racism, CRT, all this crazed, weird stuff. And they went, man, who can solve this? I guess nobody. <laughs> How about God? Maybe talk to him about it. Um, all right, going back a little further, uh, 2014 Pew Research did a study. They found that among evangelicals, so evangelicals being defined as those who believe that the Bible is the word of God and they believe that you must be born again to, ever, to enter the kingdom of heaven. So evangelicals, those who understand the word of God, have a relationship with God. Among evangelicals, 79% said that they prayed at least daily. That, at first glance, it's like, sweet, okay, that's more than half, that's good. And then you flip it around, that means 21% of evangelicals, Bible-believing evangelicals, get up in the morning, go throughout their day, without even uttering a little prayer to God. Hey, Jesus, could you give me a parking spot at Walmart? Hey, could you help me not lose my temper while I'm driving to work? I'm praying constantly. There's so many whack things out there. I said whack way more than I ever have before today. There's so many weird, screwed up things in the world. I'm constantly going, Lord, you've got to help me. Otherwise, I don't know what I'm going to do. But 21% of Bible-believing evangelicals didn't even think to utter a little prayer that they, that they figured that they could go all throughout their whole day without having to cry out to God for his blessing. And, it, you know, if it, I've, I've, done, I've been approached for surveys on various things, and I, I would imagine if someone asked me, have you, prayed, you know, have, you, have you prayed at least once every day in the last week or whatever? I would think through in my head, well, okay, there were a few days where I didn't pray like a solid half hour, solid hour or something, but I would try to come up with any way possible to make it sound like I prayed more than I did. So... <laughs> The fact that 21% admitted, no, I didn't even once say, help me, Lord, that's bad. Um, 2005 Ellis Research Group found, now this is about pastors, so if you're feeling bad, well, just wait till you hear about us pastors, uh, found that only 63% of pastors were satisfied with their prayer lives. 63% of pastors were like, yeah, I have an awesome relationship with God. My prayer life is really good. Um, now, you break that down further. They found that on average, pastors spent just 30 minutes a day praying, which maybe to you, you're like, wow, that's incredible, 30 whole minutes. But uh, it, no, that's not enough. And they broke it down further. Um, on average, pastors spent 12 minutes on prayer requests. 12 minutes to ask God to move in their church, their family, their own life, the world. Just 12 minutes a day. That's not enough. Um, eight minutes in quiet. She's like, Lord, speak to me. I'll give you eight minutes. Better be like the Micro Machines guy. <laughs> eight minutes to sit before God and listen to him. That's not enough. Uh, seven minutes giving thanks. And the remaining three minutes were in praising God for his attributes and confessing sin. That's just not enough. So I'm amazed. So 63% of pastors said that they were satisfied with this. I'm amazed that 63% of pastors said, yeah, this is good. I like my 30 minutes with Jesus. It's not enough. So if you have pastors barely praying, and then and you have people barely praying, is it any wonder that you look around and the church is struggling and our nation is struggling? We have God, the omnipotent God. He has a relationship with us, and he said, ask of me anything, and I'll give it to you. I love you. I, want, I am for you, not against you. And we go, I don't know. Maybe I'll just watch the news. Maybe I'll just figure it out. I'll get the work done myself. Man, we got to pray. It's one of the most powerful tools that we have, and the fact that the church is, is, is neglecting it is one of the greatest um, failings, I think, of, of the church in America. Prayer is powerful. We've, and um, God has given us 
So one of the reasons prayer is powerful is because God has given us a level, us as people, a level of authority on the earth, authority that he won't overstep. Genesis chapter 1. Oh, I have this nice cup of water right there. So I poured it out intentionally so I wouldn't have to. Every time I, this is really a side note here, but you will get it. Every time that I, uh, chug water like that from a bottle, it makes me think of Napoleon Dynamite. If you guys see Napoleon Dynamite, I love the movie. It's weird. It's not Christian. It's, but it's not like really bad, but there's Napoleon Dynamite. He's just kind of this odd character in there. Lovable, but odd. And at one point, he swigs this bottle. <laughs> so every time I chug a, take a sip from a bottle, I think of that, which is why I put it in the water cup so I wouldn't have to do that. All right, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Uh, God is just... What's that? Both for, for Pedro. God has just created everything. And then he says, Let us make man in our image and after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So he says, Let us make man. Let's make humans. Let us make people. And they will have dominion over every bit of creation that I've created on the earth. Other versions say, let them rule over all of creation. Let them take charge of creation. Let them have complete authority over this earth that I've created. God made the earth. He made creation. But then he put us here to have a certain level of authority on the earth. Um, next verse, verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. From the beginning, God created the earth and he placed us in here to have dominion over it, to subdue it, to have a level of authority, to be his representatives on the earth, to be his ambassadors taking care of the earth, managing the earth for him, for the king of kings. Psalm 115 verse 16 says, The heavens are the Lord's, but the earth he has given to the children of man. Another translation says that he has assigned the earth to man. Like my, my kids have different chores. And you know, one is assigned, you're going to wash the dishes. Another one is assigned, well, they all take turns washing dishes. Um, but the kids are assigned different chores. And we have a chart at home that shows each kid what chore he's going to do at which part of the day. So I don't, you know, me and Jesse, we determined who gets to be in charge of these chores. We, are all, we have ultimate authority in the home, and if someone's not doing their chore well, well, maybe we'll find somebody else to do it, or we'll just make them do it. Um, hey, good morning, guys. Um, but, God, but we assign the chores to the kids, and we say, all right, this is your job. Paul, you take care of the toilet papers in the bathroom. Naomi, you take out the trash. May, you take out the recyclables. They all have their different chores. They've been assigned to them. Well, God created the earth, and he assigned the earth to us. Yes, God has ultimate uh, authority over us and over everything. And if he wants to, he could just step in and boom, do anything. And there are certain sovereign things where he's, he determines this is what's going to be. Um, but for the most part, he has delegated that authority on the earth to us. We have a responsibility on the earth. Um, so what, what happens here, in a lot of ways, good or bad, comes down to us. What are we doing? How have we used the authority that God gave us on the earth? Um, Genesis chapter 2. Verse 15, God has made the earth, and he gave us, he, he created humanity to have dominion over the earth, to subdue it. He gave us authority over the, the earth, and it says here, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. The word keep is shamar in Hebrew. It means to watch over, to protect, to guard. He made the earth, and he put people here to have a certain level of authority on the earth, to guard it, to protect it, to bring his kingdom on the earth and let it spread throughout the earth. Brian shared a few weeks ago uh, in much more detail on this topic. And so if you want more, go to the YouTube channel. And it was a great message. And um, you can get way more information about God's original intent, his original plan to spread his kingdom, bring his, spread his love all over the planet through creating us, his ambassadors, and setting us here and telling us, hey, bring my kingdom. Have dominion, subdue the earth. So um, I won't go any more in there other than to summarize the, the, uh, the main thing I want to drive home here is that prayer is powerful because God has put us here as his representatives. 
And we have authority on the earth. Many times you talk to people and they blame God for things that aren't his fault. You know, they'll blame God for murders, for genocide, wars, um, floods, hurricanes, whatever. They'll say, why did God do this? Why did God let that accident happen? Why did God let that murder happen? God didn't do that. God didn't pick up a gun and shoot that person. It was some idiot who decided to go and disobey God and and murder somebody else. Um, And there's... The problems of the world, they're not God's fault. He placed us here as his ambassadors, as his children. It was our responsibility, still is our responsibility, to spread his kingdom on the planet. Um, and we, So we have a level of authority on the planet. Um, now, the interesting thing is there's an aspect of warfare in all of this. So we have, God has put us here on this planet as his representatives. We have a level of authority here, spiritual authority here on, on the earth as his representatives. Now, the devil it isn't just like, ah, oh, sweet, you guys can have it. The demons aren't like, oh, yeah, I guess, all right, whatever. You know, you can just go do whatever you want here. No, he's going to fight. The devil doesn't like it. He's fighting against God. He hates the people of God. And so at the same time that we have been placed here as God's representatives and we have a level of authority here, spiritual authority on the earth, um, the enemy doesn't, isn't just going to be like, all right, fine, go ahead and take it. He's, he's trying to do his own agenda. He's trying, John 10.10 10 says that he came to steal, kill, and destroy. What the enemy wants to do is to plunder the creation of God. He wants to ruin it. He wants to ruin your life, ruin your marriage, ruin your work, ruin your bank account, ruin your health, ruin your mind. That's what he wants to do. And so we are here as God's representatives with an authority over the earth to bring his kingdom, to bring his blessing, his love, his restoration. But we, we, we meet with an enemy who doesn't want that. And so there's a level of our calling and a level of prayer that is connected to warfare. In Romans 16, 20, uh, Paul writes, The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. I remember, so have you ever had a time, I'm sure you all have, where you're reading the Bible, and then you're like, what? I never saw that verse before. I had read the Bible through, you know, cover to cover, uh, probably three, four times at this point. Um, it was back in 2005, six, seven, somewhere around there. I was sitting, and we had pews at the time. I was sitting in a pew over there, and there was worship music playing, and this song came on. It was a really cheesy song. I think Jesse was here also with me, and it was a super cheesy song that came on from the 80s, I think. But um, the, the line, one of the lines in the song was, and the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet, under your feet. You remember that song? Yeah really cheesy. Um, But at the time, it was still cheesy. (laughs) So the song comes on, and they're all singing it like, yeah, we're going to crush Satan under our feet. And I'm like, that's just, that's not scriptural. That's not right. Uh, No, Jesus crushed Satan under his feet. I don't, I don't need to crush Satan under our, under my feet. Jesus already did that. He already destroyed the devil. He crushed his head. Genesis 3.15 is the prophecy that of the Messiah coming and stomping the devil's head. I don't need to do that. Jesus already did that. And so I've, I've been a believer for you know, a handful of years, like four or five, six years or something. And I'm like, clearly I know more than these vineyard worship leaders. And so I decided to get my Bible, and I'm like trying to find this verse. And, um, and then I find it in Romans, and I'm like, God, what? He's not writing this about Jesus. He's writing this about believers. I'm like, dang, I guess I was wrong. It's amazing to me. So on one level... Jesus crushed Satan under his feet on the cross. Jesus' death and resurrection on, on the cross stomped the devil's head. You know, the devil symbolically in the Bible is shown as a serpent a lot of times. And Genesis 3.15 says that Jesus will crush the serpent's head. And you can kind of think of it like on the cross, Jesus stomped on the, on the snake's head. Well, the snake did, the devil didn't just die and disappear right there. He's still writhing around. And he's still dangerous. He's still in people. He's still trying to ruin things on the earth. So Jesus, yeah, crushed his head. Definitive. He's ruined. He's going down. But we as his people now, we have to continue the work that Jesus did, kick the devil out, continue crushing Satan under our feet. It was one of these epiphany moments, listening to that verse, listening to that song, hearing the verse, and then going to the Bible with this one idea of, now, this, 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 that's just what Jesus did. How, how dare they say that I have the power that Jesus had? And then seeing in the scriptures and going, oh, well, how dare they? Because Paul dared. <laughs> it's 
hard when you're wrong and the Bible's right. <laughs> it's easy if you just go, all right, God, I guess you're right there. Um, but I had this epiphany, like, wow, yeah, Jesus crushed the serpent's head, but now we continue with that work. We have authority on the earth to make war against the enemy, to kick him out of, of cities, nations, our families, our neighborhoods. We have a responsibility as God's representatives here, not just to go, Lord, please help us, but to, but to go, look, devil, get out of my church. Get out of my family. Get out of my cousin. I'm sick of this. And we just kick him out because he has no, ultimately, he's been defeated and he has no power here. But we, as God's representatives, have, have to rise up in the authority that we have. Amen. 1990s, October 1996, I have a handful of stories today that I, I think you like. Um, uh, October 1996, there was a massive uh, Hindu convention planned for in Ramtech, India. They were expecting 70,000 Hindu militants to come, and the goal of this this um, uh, convention was to get all 70,000 people to vow to destroy Christianity and Islam in India. And so they made all these preparations and everything, and the Christians heard about it. So the churches, they, they um, gathered at least 30,000 people, Christians, to pray against this thing. The day of the event comes, and what happened was a massive storm arose out of nowhere, moved into Ramtech, India, just started pouring all over the, uh, the buildings and the tents and everything that they had, wiped everything flat. What rivers came, washed it away in mud. The event, they still did it. Eventually the storm left, they still did the event, but instead of 70,000 people coming, only 700 Hindu militants came. And when they did the call to, to, to vow, to make this oath, to destroy Christians and Muslims, nobody stood up. Nobody would make the vow. That's the power of prayer. We, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet, but we have to rise up, we have to pray, we have to rebuke the devil, we have to rebuke his kingdom, and we have to call on God to come and do a miracle on our behalf. And he will. He's waiting for us because we have authority here. God's not going to just come in, take our authority, and say, well, if you guys can't do it, I'm going to do it right. No, he's given us authority here. So now we, in our authority, have to come before him if there's something we need. Um, and if we sense God wants to do something, we come before him and we say, Lord, you gave us authority here, but God, we need you to come. We need you to rescue us. We need you to get rid of this awful convention that's going to happen. We need you to take care of this stuff, what's going on in the schools. We need you to help in our politics, help in our inner cities, help in the wherever. Jesus, come in my family. Come in my life. Well, I need you, Jesus. He's given us delegated authority here, so if we want him to move, we've got to come to him and ask him to move. Um, Another, another story from India, uh, a man named Ram Gopal, he was, he's an Indian evangelist. Uh, he, he went to a certain village in the con countryside of India who's handing out tracts. The village chieftain comes up to him um, and, and grabs his tracts, throws them away, threatens him, kicks him out of the village, tells him, if you ever come back here, we're going to kill you. So Ram leaves. Well, what did he do? He came back the next week. <laughs> But this time, instead of going straight into the village to pass out tracts, he marched around the village praying for a little while. And then he goes into the village. The, the chieftain comes up to him. And so he's feeling like, oh, what's going to happen? The chieftain gives him a hug, tells him, hey, come over into my house. They, he, he gets the tracts from him, you know, brings him into his house, and then he ended up allowing him to host a church plant in his house. <laughs> what changed? Prayer. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. If you want to get stuff done, pray. Rebuke the enemy. Go before the throne of God. And he, can, he has the power. He has power we don't have. He can change people's hearts. In uh, Proverbs, it says that God turns the heart of the king like you turn water in your hand. You put water in your hand. You can just do whatever you want with it. That's what God does with the heart of the king. And so if we sense that the Holy Spirit puts on us, man, uh, it would be awesome if whatever happened in politics. Then, okay, now that's from the Holy Spirit. We go before God with that and we say, Lord, do it. And he's got the power to do that. He's not going to manipulate people or, or control people. But he, uh, So how does that work? That he can turn it like water in his hands, but he's also not a witch doctor and not going to do voodoo on people and start controlling them. I don't know, but he can figure that out. John Wesley, who founded the Methodist Church and... Um, did a ton of amazing stuff for God. I love reading about his life. He, he took, when he started the Methodists, well, I don't know if he or maybe you could say his brother started the Methodist, Charles, but he and Charles and two other people, I don't remember their names, but they got together to meet as the Holy Club, and they, they would seek God together, and they wanted to 
Um, they were, they were in the Anglican church, but they wanted a real strong relationship with God. And so with the four of these guys that met together, well, John, God used John Wesley to grow that movement from four people to 100, 132,000 during his life. Um, this guy traveled around preaching so much that if you total up all the miles that he traveled on horseback, he could have circled the globe 10 times. This guy did a lot. He was very active, loved God, very radical for God. Well. I love one of these quotes about prayer that he says, prayer is where the action is. So this is a guy who understood action. He wanted to get stuff done, but he says, look, if you want to get stuff done, prayer. Go before God. That's where the action is. Um, in July 2000, uh, an Indian evangelist named Poonam Jadhav, she and her team were doing evangelism in a, a slum in Chindwara, India, but they were seeing no success. And, they're preaching, nobody's getting saved, and so eventually, after talking with the locals, they find out that there's three witch doctors in the neighborhood that are just tormenting everybody. And so they decided to walk around the, the whole neighborhood 250 times, <laughs> which, wow, we probably would have given up after five or six. Seven, seven, that's the holy number. Um, we probably would have given up. They were 250 times. They marched around the neighborhood, praying, declaring the kingdom of God, beating back, spiritually beating back the devil, declaring that he has no power, that he has no authority, that he's defeated, that Jesus is victorious. 250 times they marched around this neighborhood, praying and declaring God's presence. After, uh, and while they're doing that, the uh, witch doctors were there, and they're urging the witch doctors to repent. They're, they're declaring the gospel to them. The witch doctors don't, they don't receive it at all. So 250 times marching around, um, and then they went on and did some more evangelism. Six days later, uh, all three witch doctors were dead, and the entire neighborhood came to them and said, uh, we want to hear the gospel now. Prayer is warfare, and it's powerful. We, as God's representatives, we're here on the earth to bring his kingdom, bring his love, bring his peace. He won't take our authority, but he's waiting for us to use our authority to ask him to come and move. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. But we have to rise up, and we have to seek God. We have to cry out to God to do it, and we have to kick the devil's butt and tell him to leave, leave us alone. Um, but prayer isn't just warfare. Prayer... Many times, it's simply asking God for something you need, just like, like kids. For those of you who have kids, you know, you, if your kids need something, well, sometimes they'll ask you for it. Sometimes my kids like to mutter about it behind my back. I wish we could have ice cream. I wish Daddy would. Sometimes, like this happened like a week or two ago, one of them was doing something like that. And I'm like, sometimes I'll just sit and listen to it and like, say, okay, how long before they ask me? And by that time I said, or you guys could ask me instead of wishing for ice cream. You could just ask me because I want ice cream too. I'm ready to go. I'm just waiting for you to ask. I feel like God's like that with us. Sometimes we're like, oh, I wish God would move in our nation. I wish he would heal my family. I wish he would help me. I wish I, blah, blah, blah. And God's like, just ask me. I'm ready. I'm waiting for you to ask. Matthew chapter 7. Jesus tells his disciples in verse 7. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. God is not going to just automatically give, get you everything you need or want or, um, or that you, everything that you think should be, you should have in your life. He's waiting for you to ask. If you want deliverance from sin, ask him for it. If you want victory in your life, ask him for it. You want a better job, ask him for it. You need your finances taken care of, ask him for it. He's, he wants to give you everything, but, but he's waiting for you to ask him. There, uh, and and why, why is he like that? Well, I think for two reasons. One, he's given us authority on the earth, a, spirit, a level of spiritual authority on the earth, and he's not going to come and just take that away from you. He, um, so he's given you delegated authority already. And then two, he wants a relationship. If we never have to ask God for anything, we don't have to talk to him. We don't have a real relationship with him, but he wants us as his children to approach him as our father and have a real relationship with him, where if we need something, you know, that we don't view it like a, a cosmic vending machine and just push the buttons on down, poof, out pops the Pepsi. Thank you, Lord. But that, but yeah, that we, if we need something, we come before him and we say, Lord, yeah, I know you already know I need this, and you're the one who put it on my heart to pray for this, and you gave me the breath so that I could 
you know, breathe and come before you. And the, the words that I could say to you right now in the mind that I could even think about this. So you, and you knew it already that I would be here asking you for this. But Lord, please, I can't do this. You gave me authority here, but I can't figure it out. I can't do this. I need you to move. He's just, he wants us to ask him. And it builds this, a, a real loving relationship between us then that, that he's not just some distant, like people talk about the, the cosmic clockmaker, that he set the universe in order and now he just lets it run. No, God's not like that. He didn't just set things up and then go on vacation somewhere. He's active in our daily lives and he wants us to be active with him. Um, verse 9, or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Just think about how silly that would be. Like, my, my, one of my kids come to, comes to me in the morning, hey, Daddy, could I have toast? Sure. How about a piece of coal? <laughs> or if he asks for a fish, we'll give him a serpent. Yeah, wow, a terrible father would do that. Gotcha. How do you like that snake there? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask him? He wants to bless us. He wants to be good to us. He wants to give us victory. He wants to give us healing. He wants to bring revival in our nation. I've been so frustrated. Like thinking, I've been reading a lot about how God is moving in, in Iran, China, Afghanistan, India, Africa. Um, and I've been uh, reading about the Jesus people. Why did I read about that? All of a sudden, I don't know. I don't know. I've been reading, oh, I'm reading this book about the start of the vineyard churches, and um, they started during the Jesus People movement, and it's just insanely awesome to see how God reached these crazed, out of their minds, drug addicts, hippies, people seeking Eastern religions and weird stuff that they were into, and yet God is just pulling them out of that and bringing them into his kingdom. And reading this is really inspiring me that God could do it again, but also frustrating me that, God, why aren't you doing this? we got to pray. we got to seek him. We can't do that. I can't go reach into some transgender person's mind and be like, all right, fixed. But God can do that. He can heal people's hearts. Got to cry, cry out to him. Got to pray. Um, and if we ask him for it, he's going to do it. Uh, Charles Spurgeon said, whether we like it or not, asking is the rule of the kingdom. <laughs> I like that. It's like, look, sometimes it bothers me. Like I said before, I shouldn't have to ask. Well, yeah, Maybe I think that. Maybe if I get to design the universe someday, I can do that. But guess what? I didn't design the universe. God did. And this is the rule. You want it? you got to ask for it. Uh, John 14, verse 12. Truly, truly, I say to you, Jesus said this, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. He's just waiting for us to ask. Now, what does this mean? If you ask in my name, I'll do it for you. Does this mean you pray a prayer? Jesus, give me a, a hot air balloon with rainbow colors and, and, and I don't know, spaceship designs on it. And, and then he's like, no, sorry, I can't do that. And they go, oh, yeah. Jesus, give me a hot air balloon with rainbow designs and spaceships on it in Jesus' name. And then he's like, oh, shoot, you said the magic words. Now i got to give you the hot air balloon. It's not about magic words. It's not, and I've heard, I've been in prayer meetings where people do that, and I've done it myself, where we tack on in Jesus' name on everything. Lord, bless us in Jesus' name. Lord, help us in Jesus' name. Um, we tack it on like it's the magic phrase that all of a sudden God's like, well, I didn't want to, but you used the magic phrase. Now, now i got to do that for you. Now, what does it mean in Jesus' name? I think it means we ask it, according to his will. We ask it in his, as his ambassadors. Um, a few months ago, my dad was visiting, and he wanted, wanted us to get Domino's pizza. And so uh, he gave me his, his debit card, and he said, could you order this? Use my debit card to order this. And then he asked me for a name, and I'm like, well, I got to tell him Mitch because it's on the card. And uh, so I ordered pizzas for us in his name. I kind of think of it, think of what Jesus is saying here is kind of similar to that, that we, God puts something on our hearts. Um, maybe we notice in our family, wow, my kids are kind of wild. Um, man, my marriage is not going good. Um, my boss is really cranky, and I really would like it if he'd stop being cranky. So we get something, God puts something on our hearts. And so now we go in his name as his ambassadors, and we go before him and say, Lord, you gave us authority here as your ambassadors, and now I ask that you would come. You put this on my heart, so I know this is something you want, and here's the scriptures to back it up, too. So, Lord, 
Come and do this. Come and help. Come and change my situation. Come and step into my situation. I need you. Come change me. Help me, Lord. Um, help me. Um, help me to minister to my boss instead of just getting angry. Help me. Give me wisdom with my kids so that I know how to raise them right. And help, Lord, calm them down. Lord, give them a heart for you. That, that, we, that we take, God puts a motivation on our heart for prayer. And then we go before him as his ambassadors in the authority that he gave us. We say, Lord, come and do this. That's, I think, what it means to pray in his name. Not just a magic phrase that we tack on. And then he goes, oh, shoot, I guess I got to do it. Um, this is, uh, let me read an excerpt from, there's a book by Lee Strobel called The Case for Miracles. Uh, really interesting book. I highly recommend it. Where Lee Strobel has written all these The Case for books through the years. Um, well, one of the things that was really difficult for him was the idea that God could do miracles, well, like God would do miracles. Um, and so he wrote this book looking into investigating, does God do miracles nowadays? Um, are these all just fake? Are they real? What's the deal with all this? Uh, very fascinating book. He's got a lot of different interviews with um, people from all angles of it. Um, people who, atheist people who say, no, there is no God. You've got um, cessationist people that say, well, yeah, there is a God, but he doesn't do miracles anymore. And then charismatic Pentecostal types that say, yeah, there's miracles happening all the time. So he's got a lot of really interesting um, interviews in there. And he ends up at the end of the book basically concluding, yeah, God does do miracles and way more than I even realized. Um, so he's got this crazy story in there, happened in Africa. In equatorial Africa, I'm just going to read this verbatim um, from the book. In equatorial Africa, far from pharmacies and hospitals, a woman died in childbirth, leaving behind a grieving two-year-old daughter and a premature baby in danger of succumbing to the chill of the night. And yeah, Africa is actually colder at night than you would think, being Africa. Uh, with no incubator, no electricity, and few supplies, the newborn's life was in jeopardy. A helper filled a hot water bottle to maintain the warmth desperately needed by the infant, but suddenly the rubber burst, and it was the last hot water bottle in the village. A visiting missionary physician from Northern Ireland, Dr. Helen Rosevere, asked the orphans to pray for the situation. But a faith-filled 10-year-old named Ruth seemed to go too far. Please, God, send us a water bottle, she implored. It'll be no good tomorrow, God. The baby will be dead. So please send it this afternoon. As if that request was not sufficiently audacious, she added, and while you're about it, would you please send a dolly for the little girl so she'll know, know you really love her? Recalled Rosevere, I was put on the spot. Could I honestly say amen? I just did not believe that God could do this. Oh, yes, I know that he can do everything. The Bible says so. But there are limits, aren't there? The only hope of getting a water bottle would be from a parcel sent from the homeland, but she had never received one during the almost four years that she had lived there. Anyway, she mused, if anyone did send a parcel, who would put in, who would put in a hot water bottle? I live on the equator. A couple of hours later, a car dropped off a 22-pound package. The orphans helped open it and sort through the contents. Some clothing for them, bandages for the leprosy patients, and a bit of food. Oh, and this. And in quotes, as I put my hand in again, I felt the, could it really be? I grasped it and pulled it out. Yes, a brand new rubber hot water bottle, said Rosevere. I cried. I had not asked God to send it. I had not truly believed that he could. With that, little Ruth rushed, over, rushed forward. If God has sent the water bottle, he must have sent the dolly too, she exclaimed. She dug through the packaging and found it at the bottom of the parcel, a beautifully dressed doll. Asked Ruth, can I go over with you, mommy, and give this dolly to that little girl so she'll know that Jesus really loves her? That parcel had been packed five months earlier by Rosevere's former Sunday school class. The leader, feeling prompted by God, included the hot water bottle. A girl contributed the doll. And this package, the only one ever to arrive, was delivered the same day Ruth prayed for it with the faith of a child. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do. God wants to bless us. He wants to do miracles for us. He wants to deliver us. He wants to provide everything we need, but we have to go before him, and we have to ask him for it. Um, in Thailand, there was a missionary, Loon Pubuanak. Loon Pubuanak. Anyway, he was leading a church service in a um, Buddhist province, um, in Thailand, and uh, the meeting was interrupt, interrupted by a knock on the door. Um, the local leaders had arrived, and there hadn't been rain in the region. 
And so they were in danger, their crops were in danger. If rain didn't come soon, their crops were in danger of dying. And so the local leaders arrived and they said, we can't do anything. You know, they were Buddhists and they said, our, our gods are not doing anything. Our rituals aren't doing anything. The rain has still not come. Uh, if you pray and your God sends rain, we will give our lives to Jesus. And so the, the missionary, Loon, he told them, Don't, you can't play games with God. Don't, you know, if, you, if you really want to follow God, you've got to really follow God. Um, not just because you're making some deal with God. The, the local leaders, they said, no, we're for real. We've seen you, and this is such a big issue. If God can do this, yeah, we're surrendering all, and we're going to follow after him, and we're going to tell all 134 other families in the village that they have to do the same thing. So, I mean, I don't know whether they want to or not or what, but anyway. Um, so Loon said, okay, all right, we'll pray. And so he and the church, they got together for three days to fast and to pray and just simply ask Jesus, send the rain. On the fourth day, monsoons came in, and all 134 families gave their lives to Jesus. Just got to ask. You know, this past weekend, um, we had all these our events going on here, and, um, and uh, the forecast looked like it was going to be a ton of rain. They were saying storms and get ready for hail and everything. And all of us in the church were like, no, Lord, please, no. We need, we need sun. We need, well, just not rain. If it's clouds, fine. If it's sun, fine. We just need not rain because that would ruin everything. Artwork would get messed up. And nobody wants to eat a burger in the rain. That's no fun. And, uh, and so we're praying, praying, praying all week. Well, yesterday we had just a little bit of rain. But it was, it was like about the, the, the best day that we could ask for. It wasn't too hot. It was nice and breezy, a little too humid. So, Lord, if you can get that next time. Um, but it was amazing. And so earlier in the week, they're like, monsoons are coming. We pray. Okay, now no, everything's beautiful. Now, here's the really wild thing, too, with that. Yesterday here, it was really good. Um, Hartford, mo most of our kids were back in Hartford, and Jesse was talking to them up in Hartford, and they're like, yeah, uh, it's raining, like, nonstop, all day they had uh, downpours. Well, even weirder, me and Richard, at one point, we went out to go pick up some chips. We were over here, we get in the car, we start going away, it started raining a little bit, and I'm like, oh, okay, so dang, rain's coming, well, they'll figure it out. We get to Pick and Save, which is what, like, quarter mile away, half a mile away, something like that. It's downpouring in Pick and Save. It's raining while we're in Pick and Save. It rained while we were out. And then we come here, and I asked Jesse, oh, did you guys get the artwork inside the tent? Okay. And she's like, it didn't really rain, just a little sprinkle. Like, okay, Lord, that's awesome. Jesus has power like that. And as we pray, as we cry out to him, he answers us. All we got to do is ask. He's our dad. He's our father. He wants to give us good stuff. We just got to ask him for it. Amen. Uh, Matthew 18, verse 19, more prayer advice from Jesus. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on anything, on, sorry, again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. One of the amazing things about prayer is that God actually answers us. Um, what, what's this deal about two agreeing on anything? You know, you could take this literally and in a weird way, which I don't think you should do. And you could say, oh, okay, so I just got to get somebody, I got to convince somebody to say, yeah, amen, for my goofy prayer. And then God's like, dang it, it's like they use the magic words again, but now they're just agreeing together and I got to give them the, whatever they're asking. No, that, the point of this is, well, I heard Kenneth Copeland, who I don't agree with everything he says, but he said something interesting about this one time where he said, um, joking, he said, the reason God, God's, God almost has to, is almost obligated to answer our prayers when two of us agree on anything because two people never agree on anything. So it's so rare that he's like, well. <laughs> but I think the point being, if, if it's on your heart, and if it's on, and you're a child of God, you have the Spirit of God in you, and it's on their heart, they're a child of God, they have the Spirit of God in you, chances are pretty good that if you're both thinking this and you both have God in you, that probably is from God. If you have something on your heart and someone else goes, no, I don't see that, well, maybe it's from God, maybe not. But if two of you agree on it and you're feeling like it's from God, that's probably God. And so I think what Jesus is saying here essentially is, look, if God wants to do it, ask him for it. He's going to do it. Not that we uh, twist his arm and get somebody to say, yeah, I agree. And then, oh, now he's got to do it because he said the magic words again. Um, when Jesse and I first got married, that's such a weird phrase. Not that we got secondly married. Um, when we got married, actually when we got engaged, before we got married, we had no money. When we got married, we had no money also. Um, was back in 2003, we got engaged, and four, we got married. 
Oh, you're right. Yeah, three we met. Yeah. All right. Um, I could not have stayed engaged for a year. <laughs> that would not have worked out well. Um, so we got engaged 2004, and then we started making all the, like, the plans for the wedding. And we had a very simple wedding. Um, very cheap, very simple wedding. But as we're making the plans, we realized we have nothing. There is no way. Uh, like, my job was not very good. I was making $100 a week as the church slave. That's, <laughs> we didn't literally have a church slave. Everybody jokingly referred to me as a church slave, myself included. Um, I loved it. I just was here to serve God. And um, I didn't care. Whatever you needed, I'll do it. Um, and so jokingly, they, we called me the church slave. Um, but uh, I think a big hundred bucks a week, and Jessie was working the okay job, but she had to give that up. We knew she would be giving that up um, after we got married and started having kids, and we had no savings, and my car was bad and falling apart, and so we had all these problems, and we didn't have money for a wedding, and our parents weren't wealthy, we aren't wealthy, weren't going to just give us whatever we wanted, and I, we were committed to, we didn't want to go into debt, I didn't want to get a credit card and max that out for one celebration? Like, that seems foolish. Um, and so we got together, and we made what we call our miracle list, where I put on the, top of the, on the top of the paper, Matthew 18, 19 through 20. If two of you agree on anything, I will do it for them, for you. And um, then we just listed one after another. We need this, we need this, we need this, we need this. And every day, we'd be praying, Lord, you said if, if two agree on anything, you're going to do it. So we agreed on, boom, 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 we need it. And then as God answered each one of those, we would check it off. And um, at, by the time we got married, he had answered every single one of those things. And we had, got the money that we needed. We got the car that we needed. We got this thing fixed, that thing. Every single one of those things on the miracle list, God did. There is power. When you come, when you come before God in faith, grabbing a hold of something that he put on your heart, you say, and you don't waver from that, you say, Lord, you said if we agree on this, you're going to do it. And, I, and you put it in my heart. You put it in her heart. Lord, do it. We need this. And you just keep coming in faith before him, then he's going to do it. The key is you've got to keep coming in faith before him. You've got to actually believe for it. Uh, here's another, another story I want to read to you. Uh, this is from the book Spirit-Led Evangelism by Chayan, which is an, probably my favorite evangelism book I've ever read. Um, so if you're interested in evangelism at all, I highly recommend it. Spirit-Led Evangelism by Cheyenne. Um, it's about Jim, I don't know how to say his last name, Simbala, a pastor in Brooklyn. Uh, okay, so one of the greatest testimonies of this type of prayer I, I have ever heard came from Pastor Jim Simbala of the Brooklyn Tabernacle Church. I heard him tell this story at one of Jack Hayford's pastor's conferences some years ago. Jim had a backslidden daughter who had a baby out of wedlock and was living with her boyfriend. She had left the church several years prior. Jim had a large congregation but was going through a season of depression because his daughter was lost. One day, a church member came up to Jim and said that the whole church should agree in prayer for Jim's daughter at the weekly prayer meeting. Initially, Jim was re reluctant, not wanting to draw attention to himself and his problems. Eventually, he agreed. That next meeting, the whole church agreed together and cried out in, in prayer on behalf of Jim's daughter. Early the next morning, Jim was shaving and getting ready as usual for the day. There came a knock on the door. Jim's wife opened the door and could not believe her eyes. Their daughter fell to her knees and grabbed her mother's legs, begging her forgiveness for all the rebellion and sins she had committed. Then the daughter asked urgently, where is dad? He's upstairs shaving, her stunned mom replied. Quickly, she ran upstairs and knocked on the door. When Jim opened the door, he was shocked to see his daughter. She got down on her knees and began to weep and ask Jim's forgiveness for all the sins she had committed. Then she asked dad, what happened last night? Jim had to think for a moment to reorient himself. Then he replied, oh, uh, we prayed for you as a church. Why? She told him that in the night she had had a dreadful dream. It was so real, she said. I thought I had actually died, and I saw myself going to hell. The experience was so horrendous that she cried out to God and asked him for a second chance. At that moment, she woke up and realized that it was a dream. She said that when morning came, the first thing she wanted to do was to go to him and ask for forgiveness. Jim's daughter radically repented and came back to Jesus. Her boyfriend also came to know Christ. Today, they are married and both are working on the church staff. Amen. When you come before God and ask in faith, and you know it's him saying, this is what I want to do, and you come and grab a hold of that and say, Lord, you put it on my heart, you put it on her, her heart, and it's in the scriptures, Lord, do it, and he answers our prayer. We just got to come before him and ask him and stand in faith. All right, let me close with... Um, some of my favorite prayer quotes. Um, Andrew Murray, 
who lived uh, 1828 to 1917. If you don't know Andrew Murray, um, he's, he was a South African pastor who wrote extensively about prayer and having a deep life full of the spirit. Um, all of his books, I, I would recommend every single one of his books. They're all good. They're all challenging, all convicting, and you will not go wrong reading them. Um, but he says here, God in the mystery of prayer has entrusted us with a force that can move the heavenly world and can bring its power down to earth. Again, he says, prayer opens the way for God himself to do his work in us and through us. We can't solve everything on our own as much as we want to, as much as we want to just get going, get busy, get this fixed. We can't. There are problems too big for us. That's where we go to God and we say, Lord, I know you gave us authority here, but we can't do it. Come in. Rescue us. Do it. And then he, get, he comes in his power and through us gets it done. Ian Bounds, who lived 1835 to 1913, he's basically the American version of Andrew Murray. <laughs> Again, wrote about prayer a ton and a deep life in God, and every single one of his books is incredible. Um, some of these old guys, you know, there's a lot of Christian books nowadays where people are writing about little trendy topics here and there. Some of those are fine, but these old guys, man, I love their stuff. So Ian Bounds, he writes, Prayer breaks all bars, dissolves all chains, opens all prisons, and widens all straits by which God's saints have been held. A.W. Tozer, I'm going to close with this one. Uh, A.W. Tozer, the uh, same vein as Andrew Murray and E.M. Bounds, every single thing he ever wrote is amazing, at least so far in my experience, and maybe somebody can find something they didn't like. Um, real giant to the faith. Um, he writes about prayer. The key to prayer is simply praying. It's like we get all hung up on this thing or that thing, this strategy, that's right. Just pray. Just do it. Too many of us, we're not praying. We're not doing it. So we just got to go before God and pray. Um, so I talked about standing in our authority, like our delegated authority, and praying in that. I talked about our prayers being warfare and just kicking the devil out of our communities and our, our families. Talked about simply coming before God and asking him as his child, Lord, we need this, do it. Talked about asking things in his name as his ambassadors, and that he's ready to do it. I talked about praying in agreement, that, you, that more than one person, you both know that the Holy Spirit says, put this on my heart, he wants to do it. And so you come together and you pray in agreement, grabbing hold of the fact that this is something God wants to do. But ultimately, really what matters is not these strategies, not knowing this thing or that thing or this fact or that fact. What really matters, we got to pray. Our nation needs Jesus bad. People need Jesus. People are stressed out, freaked out, confused, disoriented, mad at each other, ruining things left and right, thinking they're, trying to f thinking they're fixing it, but they're making things worse from the government on down to everybody else. We're not good. Our families are messed up. People are messed up. Churches are messed up. Um, rather than getting frustrated and depressed about it, pray. Ask God to move, and he will move. Amen? Amen? Jesus, thank you for the power of prayer. Thank you for the responsibility that you've given us as your representatives to care for the earth and the, the great calling that we have to pray. Father, I, I, I ask that you would pour out upon us a spirit of prayer and a spirit of faith as we pray. That we, Lord, I'm tired of hearing just whining prayer, whiny prayer meetings. Not that I'm not blaming anybody in case anybody thinks I'm judging you here. Not. Lord, I've been that myself, and I'm tired of just whining at you about stuff. God, I want to come before you in faith, knowing you're going to answer it, knowing that you're good and that, that you want to bless us. You want to bless our nation. Lord, I pray that you would stir up faith in us and stir up a real passion for prayer, real desire to come before you and see you do the impossible, to see you do things that we can't do, fix things that we can't fix, repair things that we can't repair. Uh, pour out that, that passion and that faith in Jesus' name. Amen.